think the first question I wanted to ask, and we'll hopefully have a little time for those of you in the audience who have questions. I don't know who wants to start first. What do you think is most important for people to take away from once they learn about homeboys, when they hear your stories, when they are hopefully impacted by it? If you had to put it in a sentence or two or three, what would you say? Actually, you know what, so why don't we start and just go down the road, okay? Put me on the hot spot, Frank. Yeah. Um, people need support. If people feel like they're alone in this battle, it makes it harder for them to find the healing that they need to embrace. Um, and when I found people who were willing to stand with me and be there with me, it made it a lot easier for me to realize that maybe this thing can work for me. Maybe I can find out what it means to be normal, even though I'm still not normal. Um, but I feel now that I'm not alone and there's so many people that I can go to that I trust and I can open up to and not feel like they're going to take advantage of me or that they're there because they want something from me, but that they're there genuinely because they just want me to be the best me. And anybody that wants me to be the best me, I'm for that. I think for me, man, um, hope. Because nobody ever in their life had hope in me. And I'm going to tell you what homeboys gave me. They gave me a face and a place. A face to look in the mirror every day. <clears throat> to tell George that he, he loves him. Because today I love myself. A place where we can call home. And that's Homo Industries. Um, for me, I think the most important thing is the communication. You know, um, growing up, there were so many things that I was never taught or told. Simple things. You're worthy. You can do it. You know, um, unfortunately, I had to learn a lot of things in prison about how to be a woman. Or I had to learn by doing them and getting pregnant at 14. Um, since I've been in this organization, I've been so blessed to be around so many different people. And I see that, like I said, um, hiking ain't for white people, you know? <laughs> but you know what I, what I like is that, you know what, I, I've learned that, you know, just as much as I can say that people are prejudiced toward me, I learned that I've been prejudiced toward others. And when I say that, I say that there's actually nice people in all colors, you know, and I think that there's a lack of communication. I think if we all would stop being so afraid of each other and stop using our own crazy perception and maybe just reach out and ask somebody what's going on, that we might have a different understanding. Because you know what, I'm, I bleed, I cry, everything the same as all of you. But the thing is, I think that lots of times we're so afraid that we don't take the time out to ask the questions or get to know somebody, you know? Um, we let this take us to some crazy places. And, you know, I'm learning that there's not, everything outside of love don't exist. We all made that stuff up. The only thing that God has made all of us is perfect in his image and with love. So all the other stuff that we do, you guys, it doesn't exist. That's what I learned. Uh, for me, it would be um, unconditional love. You know, before I came to Homeboys, Love ha always had a price, right? I'll love you if this, or if you do this, I'll love you, you know? Um, when I walked through these doors, I, you know, before I came here, I used to, you know, nobody did nothing for free, you know what I mean? It was always had something behind it until I came here and people were giving me hugs and telling me they loved me. And I, I was like, what is this place? <laughs> 
but then I learned that they loved me for just me, just for because I was here, you know. So for me, that's the one thing that I take you guys take back for that. For me, it's investment. Uh, uh, Father Greg invested in me. That's what it was when I walked in through these doors. Uh, before that, my gang invested in me, and that's why I and, and that's why I followed that movement for so long. And that's why I'm here now at Homewood Industries, and I always tell Father Greg, this is the Homewood movement of love, of kinship, of showing me a whole different way of life, of being free, God, God damn it, you know? <laughs> Just being free, being part of society and being able to take your kids to school for the first day of school, you know, and that's what home was at KP. Just being being able to understand freedom and being able to love myself, love others and People talk about race and all this stuff, right? But race, homeboy industry doesn't have a color. Homeboy industry, the building is yellow. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> and like George said, this is home. This is a new beginning. Thank you, Pops, for investing in me. Thank and all the staff. It's not what Greek what G created here is this. He created a, a place where we could put everybody so I could go ask questions. I could go to my case manager, my navigator, my whoever whoever it is, I could go to Lamai and be like Lamai. I don't know how it works on your side, but can you can you can you, can you let me know a little bit of this so I can understand it? And that's what Humble Industries is for me, is it's the gold on the other side of the rainbow, like, like you could say. Thank you. So let's go down in order again. Um, if you remember, because these, what you've done, how you've changed the work you've done on yourselves and the work you've done here is quite amazing. Do you remember one of the hardest moments, uh, something that stands out where it was really difficult for you and you were either able to deal with it, handle it or not, but then came back the next time to make the change, to struggle with the demons, to look at the dark side? Easy questions. <laughs> Um, so that's uh, weird that you asked that question because I was actually just talking to somebody mm -hmm. earlier about that. Um, and I think one of my biggest struggles has been, in a sense, forgiving myself. Um, because I've done so much to tear down communities, I never felt like I deserved to have anything. Um, even now, I still struggle with taking compliments. It can be painful for me sometimes to take a compliment. And when I was talking earlier with someone and I told him, I said, you know, like I was, I was very, I was in a place where I just was like, ah, I want to hurry up and get this over with. You know, I just want to get through it because I felt like I didn't deserve to be seen in this light. You know, like I would rather, I would feel more comfortable being seen as a gang member who was tearing up neighborhoods because that feels more comfortable to me than, you know, somebody putting me in a light where it says that I'm healing, that I'm trying to do all this great work because um, it feels sappy, you know, and where I come from, you don't, you don't, you're not allowed to feel like that. Um, but I did say in that same conversation that, I think the reason why I go there is because I bring my past with me to that. And in my struggle, I realize it. And so for me, it's very helpful for me to realize it so I can work through it. Because it took me, I started when I was nine years old, and I didn't stop till I was 30. 
So it took me 21 years to do all this damage to myself. And so I have to forgive myself and allow myself to remember that it might take just as much time for me to get the healing that I'm seeking, you know, the total healing that I'm seeking. Um, and so I'm still a work in progress. I think that my, my biggest struggle that I had when I first came around here, right, was uh, taking down my brick wall that I built for 32 years. Um, no one's going to hurt me because they got to get through that brick wall in order to get to me. And I was a runner. I ran for my feelings. I stuck a needle in my arm to stop the, 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 the feeling because I wasn't healing. But once I came in through these double doors, I felt the aroma in the air. Like Emily said, somebody embraced her. The whole building embraced me. The aroma that you feel in the air when you're walking through those double doors. And when I, when I say aroma, that goes, as I'm talking about everything, hope, kinship, love. And the main one for me that Father Greg talks about a lot is tenderness. Compassion, empathy, knowing that you're not the only one that went, ever went through that struggle. And my struggle was taking down that brick wall because as a child, I was hurt a lot. That's what, to, that's what made me go to that gang lifestyle because they lied to me and they said that they're going to take care of me. They gave me that false information that I, that, I, that I grasped and I ran with it for 32 years. They didn't tell me that I was gonna be, I was gonna be in and out of prison. They didn't tell me I was gonna get shot. Those are the things that they kept for me because it's an illusion. But I was okay with that. <clears throat> Because I didn't have those, um, those, those uh, positive uh, role models and those examples in my life. I had the negativity. And I was okay with that. I thought it was okay. I thought that's the way you're supposed to live. Nobody told me about no healing. They told me, lick your own wounds. But today, I'm taking that brick wall down one brick at a time. And I'm, get, I'm seeing the sunshine that I was supposed to see a long time ago. But it was taken from me. Today, I got a choice to wake up in the morning and thank God that he woke me up. I got a choice today to come to work. I got a choice today to embrace someone, the next man in front of me, the next woman in front of me. I got a choice to practice tenderness, compassion, and kinship. And I choose to do that. I choose today to do that. So for me, my, my biggest demon was me. Um, you know, I'm in recovery. I just turned seven years clean and sober in February. Thank you. And, and you know what? Um, we had a dinner with my sponsor and some friends, and one of my friends said, Emily, this is your spiritual year. And for whatever reason, I, I believe I clung on to that. For the last six years, I've been here. You know, we have a saying, Fake it until you make it in recovery. I didn't realize that I was just, I was, I've been struggling the last six years. Even though I was here in the midst of helping people. I could not, like everyone else says, believe that I deserved anything. I was no good. I was a trash. I was going to wind up pregnant at a young age, and I was going to be in prison, and I was going to be a drug addict, and no one was going to want you from a little girl on. Now, you take that 
being told for 39 years and you change it. You can't, not automatically. And so even here, you know, I would beat myself. People would tell me, you're amazing. You save lives. And I, I, okay, but then I walk out the door and I feel like shit. I couldn't grasp it. I couldn't believe it. I don't know what's happened this year, but I like it. <laughs> I feel, I know, I know that I'm worthy. You know what? I know that I'm good at what I do. I know that I'm sitting here and I'm standing here because I'm supposed to be here. You know, um, I believe in myself more than I have ever in my life. And like you guys say, it's a work in progress. And, you know, and I'm excited because if I feel this good after seven years, how am I going to feel in the next 10, you know? Uh, this high is better than any high I've ever had. You know, when I used to take a hit off the pipe, I used to have confidence. I used to believe in myself. I felt good. I used to come up with plans and, you know, schemes and scams and <laughs> couldn't tell me I wasn't going to do it. I'd do it. But now... When someone comes back and says, especially a knucklehead <laughs> that doesn't want to go to recovery, doesn't want to do nothing, but then when they come back and they say, thank you. And, and I was every bad name in the book and they couldn't stand me, but when they come back and they say, thank you, man, that's a bigger blast than the, the blast I ever took off a pipe. And now I find myself running and searching for that that high and you know and so not only do I get to you know be rewarded by that high but also so does my brothers and sisters you know and um so just learning to believe in ourselves you know that I'm my I'm my enemy I don't need none of you guys to do it for me I'll do it perfectly fine by myself <laughs> you know but um you know, G, I love you, and I, I can never, you gave me my God back. And that changed me so much. You know, one day I asked G, am I going to go to hell because I'm gay? And I remember you said, you are so beautiful in God's image that God can't even look upon you. I always remember that. You returned me to God. Because I said, if he believes that, who the hell am I not to? <laughs> I love you, G. Um, I think for me, communication was my biggest thing. Um, my household, we were always fighting, you know. <laughs> Alcohol was always involved, and there was always arguments and fights all the time. So that's how I grew up, and that's how I, I learned how to communicate that way. Um, I learned that the easiest way to get you to hear me was to put my hands on you, because you're going <laughs> to listen to me, you know. And then I got to Homeboy Industries, and then everybody wants to talk about things, right? Like, this place, <laughs> like... Everybody's always asking a question, right? And, and you cannot just not answer the question, you know? Because somebody else will ask the same question. And it's funny because I'm sitting here and I'm looking at my son, and I've learned now to communicate. Now I'm learning the I statements and the this is how I feel, you know, like all this stuff, you know? Right? So my son Daniel, he's always telling me, Mom, you talk too much. Why are you always talking, you know? And I, as I was listening to everybody, because they're all saying my story too, you know, now I learn how to communicate. Well, I'm st I still battle with it because sometimes I still in my mind tells me like, are they talking, are they little keep talking shit? Or like, what are they trying to, t what are they really trying to say, you know? Um, so I still struggle with that, but I I'm trying my best, you know, and um, communication. So now in my household, even though my son doesn't understand it, now he knows why, you know, because uh, nobody ever asked me no questions growing up. Nobody asked me how was my day. Nobody said, what'd you do today, you know? Who are you talking to? <laughs> you know? um, 
so communication was one of my biggest struggles coming here. Now I'm still, you know, every day I'm learning how, and hopefully it's, it goes trickles down to my son, you know, so he'll know why communication is important. For me, the biggest struggle when I got here is I felt like the whole the whole system was great to pimp me, to just pimp me, just to use me to make money off of me. Since I was in juvenile hall, all the way to prison, all the way through everything, they were always getting paid to hold me hostage. That's how I felt. As I, I went to juvenile hall at nine years old. So ever since then, I always felt like these fucking white people are getting paid to hold me hostage. I'm sorry to say like that, but that's how I felt for a long time. And I was like, why? And when I came to home, I still had a little chip. I still do. To be honest with you, I still got a chip on my shoulder. You know, I ain't going to... See here, and when Father Greg first, for the here son, go get yourself some clothes. I'm like, why is this white guy trying to give me some money so I can get some clothes? <laughs> what the hell does he want? <laughs> and he just looked at me with those eyes. I was like, damn, like, those eyes could pierce you. <laughs> you know, and when I first got here, that's what I looked at. I was like, oh, shit. He's telling me to get some clothes so I can come to work tomorrow. And I didn't have no clothes at that time. And that's always been my struggle. My struggle is always, I'm tired of being this people's uh, hoe because they've been making money off of me all along, the whole system. And that's also my anger, and it's also the thing that keeps me going. You know, the anger that I use to say, no, enough is enough. And I can't allow them to make one more dollar off of me in this county jail. <laughs> I can't allow them for them to say, they need this money that needs to go to our schools or to a program like Homeboy Industries, to the county jail. And that's what I... That's why I say every morning when I, when I go out there and I stand in front of the county jail and I smoke a cigarette and I look, I'm like, damn, they're taking some of my homies' lives away. You know? It's my brothers getting locked up, doing life for nothing. And I ain't saying for nothing, like they didn't commit a crime, but their lives is getting thrown away without giving them a chance to actually live. Because when I was in there, I used to just say, just let me go out there so I can bury my people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they said four funerals in the last four weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck this. <laughs> Why did I ask for that? <laughs> Why? Well, that's my struggle. My struggle is that my friends are always going to be my friends. And if, even if they don't change their lives, that's a decision they made, but I still have to bury them. I still have to bury the, the kid that I was playing water balloons with the first time I got, I got arrested and put in, in jail for sitting in a stolen car I didn't steal. You know? And that's, that's was the pain that I'm still working on with my therapist. That's why I have to see my therapist every Monday. I'm there 15 minutes earlier, sometimes knocking, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes knocking on the door and being like, are you ready for me? She's like, I got another client. And, and sometimes I, she, I cheat and I, I go and I, I see the other therapist. I'll be like, do you got a minute? I'll, I'll be like, I, I'm going through some shit today. <laughs> it just, it just, it's just so heavy that, and at first I used to be, I, and to be honest, the first time I seen Teresa, I said, what is this white lady going over my life? 
God damn it, I went through the bottom. I've been broken all the way. What's she going on? Then I sat there and I talked to her. And she come for me at a time when I was in extremely pain. And I was just like, damn. This is why people are nice. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. I just needed those five minutes. Just, I just stole from somebody else. But I just needed those five minutes to just be like, just hear me out. Just, and she always got her door open. And I think that's what makes homeboys great, that everybody got their open, the door open. Even the CEO, he's the older white guy right here. And I'll be like, Tom, I got a question for you. I guess today you're going to be my therapist, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, um, it's, it's that. And I'm still battling with that, and I'm still working on that. I'm still working. I'm native, man. We've been fucked over our whole lives. You know, everybody claims this land and everybody claims this and that and my people are still struggling. That's you know, but that's what homeboys is still doing for me. I ain't gonna say it's done for me. Still doing for me. I was just in Teresa's office earlier today. <laughs> you know? Thank you. To you, yeah. I think we're. I'm seeing so if. Speechless. Yeah. <laughs> well, if somebody wants to ask them a question or something, they perfected how this air conditioning's on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well. Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, I, I I did time myself nine months county jail, so I want props. Okay, ex-con talking. <laughs> Okay. Um, and, <laughs> I, yeah, because I sound so much like it. Uh, and, you know, I got through it through reading and writing, and why, I wanted to ask if Homeboys uh, has a library, because I know I can't be the only one here who has more extra books than shelf space and would love, uh, starting with <laughs> one I happen to bring, I would love to contribute uh, my extra books to it. Yeah, we have. You can see downstairs we have a kind of a lend, lending library. People leave a book, take a book. There's also Libros Schmibros, which is a wonderful thing in Boyle Heights. If you ever want to uh, leave off your books, and it serves the community and supports literacy. And so that's thank you. So I think we're ending the time that we're doing the lot. Oh, one more question, then we'll end the time with the live stream. Take the mic, so. Hi, congratulations, by the way. And um, what I was curious about is, do you have any um, edu education at all about other gangs from other countries where you make those kind of comparisons or you get to communicate to them, let's say, gangs that are, <clears throat> that are coming out of that, you know, in South America, South Africa, and different countries, because, you know, that I work with over there, that would do anything to be able to communicate with what's going on over here and need help that you can maybe give at this point. Yeah, that's a, a, a plug uh, <laughs> moment. Thank you, because we have a thing called the Global Homeboy Network, and it's um, uh, because years ago when uh, it was when we moved into this building, actually, when we started to, delegations from different places would come. You know, so Wichita was the first one that came and did this. Look, well, like, here are these five people from Wichita. I believe they were white. And uh, <laughs> anyway, they, they seem to be nice. And so, um, and they said airlift a homeboy into Wichita. And so we kind of, I remember we had this meeting with, you know, the homies and the homegirls and staff. We said, hey, do we really want to do that, you know? And being in this building, which is our fourth location, we, we said, well, we could do that. We could become, as I always say, the McDonald's of uh, gang intervention programs. <laughs> Over five billion gang members served. <laughs> and we decided not to do that. So we said, well, what if we offer uh, technical assistance? So that's kind of what we ended up doing. And so we, um, now we've had just uh, so, I don't know, I, any idea of how many thousands of of delegations uh, over the years since, since 2008. 
So now we have a thing of a global homeboy network. So we have, I don't know what my count, but we said 146 programs in the country modeled on homeboy 16 outside the country. We're about to have our fifth annual, fifth annual gathering uh, right on the block at California Endowment. And so, how many people do we have from all over the world? Yeah, so nearly 300 people from all over. So, um, so pl people have come here, and we said, D don't use our name except to say that you're a partner in the Global Homeboy Network, because we don't want to have to worry about how is, you know, Homeboy doing in Sydney, Australia. So they start the, the program with their own name, born from below, as which is why I think this place has worked. And so um, we gather, and it's kind of a love fest. You know, it's two and a half days of, of just uh, best practices and people. So Guatemala and, and Glasgow and Chicago and Spokane, and, and the list is long, uh, Denver. And so most people are working with either, if not gang, gang members, or, you know, uh, street kids or young people mainly, uh, folks who are feeling kind of left out, and uh, so that's that. <laughs> and also, uh, Kim told me as I was uh, walking up the stairs, she said, please mention that September 22 is our 5K, so please, everybody run. Yeah. Thanks. So in wrapping up, I want to again thank each of you up here, all of the staff from Homeboys who does the day in and day out work, Father Greg for what you do, and you can go to their website, you can support them in a variety of different ways. They also have their fundraiser coming up. When is that? Do you have a fundraiser coming up soon, Allison? The, the run is coming up. Okay, the run. Okay. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, and the film is available, as I said, it's free, and I will volunteer each of these people to speak at different screenings. I'm volunteering <laughs> for you. You've, you've seen them in the film, you've heard their eloquence, their powerful and moving stories, and their courage and guts and smarts, and the job that all of us can do, and not just leave it to Father Greg and the homies, the job that all of us can do is take some action with the film, with a screening, spread the word. We know that the times we're in, there's a tremendous amount of hate and anger and fear that's being generated, and these people and these stories are ways to counter that. So I hope all of you will join all of us and Father Greg and the homies in the fight ahead. Thank you.